Welcome everyone. We want to thank you for joining us this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you're calling in from. Um, we are really pleased to be able to put on this program today. The title of the program is called Understanding Campus Save, Strategies for Partnership and Prevention. Um, want to go through some housekeeping details before we start. The first is there is a panel on the right side of your screen, and that is the areas for questions. So there you can type your questions and we will try to answer them as we go along, or we can also provide you with individualized answers if you have a question specific to your institution. If we can't answer all the questions throughout the program, we'll make a, we'll make a point to follow up afterwards, either with you or at the end of the webinar. If you're having trouble using your computer's audio, um, you can use your telephone through the information you have received in the email and all you need to do is call in the dial-in number there. And you can follow along with the slides on the webinar system, but then also listen via phone or speakerphone. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded and will be available online. So you can watch it as often as you like and also share it with other folks within your department. Um, this is brought to you by the Cleary Center for Security on Campus. Our website is on the bottom of the screen and you can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter. I want to welcome our presenters today. I'm Allison Kiss. I'm the Executive Director of the Cleary Center for Security on Campus. My colleague Abigail Boyer is a Director of Communications and will also be presenting some of the webinar. And then really, our idea for this webinar was solutions-based. We realize that a lot of institutions in dealing with Campus Save and responding to the obligations um, have challenges with funding or building partnerships. So really to mirror what we preach, so to speak, we invited two of our community partners in to talk about some of the work that they do with colleges and universities and that they're funded to do. So they're going to share some of the things that they do in working with um, campuses in their area. So I'd like to also welcome Tommy, who's the Director of Training and Education at the Laurel House of Montgomery County in Pennsylvania, and Carol, who's a Prevention Specialist at the Crime Victim Center of Chester County. And so they're both going to share some examples of things that they do or partnerships that they've built with colleges and universities in their area. Our learning objectives today. Today we're gonna cover in an hour, which is not a lot of time, we're gonna cover the Campus Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights because the Campus Save Act or the expansion of Cleary requirements really builds on the Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights, which is a 1992 amendment to Cleary. We're also gonna talk about the prevention education components and some of the evidence-based practices that are put into place as a result of safe, pa partner, of safe passing and also some strategies for partnering for compliance. So how you can work with your community agency or county agency um, to comply with federal law. A little bit of history about our organization. Um, Jean Cleary, was brutally raped and murdered on April 5th, 1986 by another student whom she did not know. Uh, this occurred in her residence hall. Her parents, it really led to national awareness of campus crime and her parents started, this happened in Pennsylvania, and they started to really pioneer legislation on the state level and they passed close to 25 state laws until they went on to pass the federal Gene Cleary Act where they worked with our own, the late um, Arlen Specter, Senator from Pennsylvania to create the legislation and then advocate for its passage. It's important that we, we get a summary of the Clery Act before we go into these amendments or changes that will occur. First, the annual security report. The annual security report includes statements of policy, or as I like to call them, the cliff notes of your policy. So your policy statements in your annual security report should be short, they should be concise, and they should summarize or point to a full policy that your campus will have. So for example, right now, one of the elements of an annual security report is to include a sex offense policy. It also includes three years, preceding years of campus crime statistics. And those are statistics reportable using um, counting, collect collecting, and classifying through Cleary. Uh, we do trainings all over the country where we spend a day and a half, and the first half of that day is really truly on 
using uniform crime reporting and how to collect and classify crime statistics. It also includes elements of the Campus Sexual Assault Victim Bill of Rights. And we'll go through a summary of what that is. And the Campus Save Act really is the first major amendment to, to that in about 20 years, because again, the Campus Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights was included in 1992 amendments. There's also an ongoing disclosure requirement. So where campuses are required to have policies around emergency notifications, timely warnings, and a public crime log that's made available to anyone who requests it. And lastly, the United States Department of Education enforces the Clery Act. So there's a per violation fine of $35,000 per violation if there is a campus found in violation of the Clery Act. A little more on the history of the law. It was originally passed in 1990 as part of the Student Right to Know Act. And then the last amendments were in 1992, and I referenced the Campus Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights, 1998, and then the most recent amendments were in 2008. Um, and I think most notably in those amendments, we have the emergency notification requirements, um, which certainly were uh, as a result of the shooting at Virginia Tech in 2007. Um, there's information if you do want to go to the statutes and read the regulations as to where you can find those rules um, or more information. Clery compliance really comes down to institutional responsibility. Uh, one of the common mistakes that we see are that folks look at Clery compliance and think of it as solely campus police, security, or public safety's role or there may be one lone soldier who's charged with Cleary compliance. And that's not really, no matter how committed that lone soldier is, he or she is going to have a lot of problems or will struggle quite a bit without that support from the leadership or from the top down. So it's important to get that coordination from the top down. And again, we're out in front of the Campus Save Act just passed. Uh, there's time before it really goes into where it will be enacted. So we want to make sure that you have certain steps, and that's part of this, the purpose of this webinar, are to have things in place to make compliance for you easier. You want to engage student affairs, house, um, housing, uh, human resources, academic departments. You probably have experts on your campus who could help you that you don't know about. So really doing a scan of your campus to see who's around and who can help you. We also just had a question from a participant that I wanted to address. Um, he asked whether the presentation was going to be available to attendees. So hopefully you are seeing the slides on your screen. If you are not for some reason, please let us know through that question panel so that we can address that and make sure that you have access to them. Following the presentation, if you would like access to the slides as well, please feel free to email um, aboyer at clearycenter.org and that email will be available again at the end of the presentation and we can certainly send those over to you. As for campus security authorities, as you know, the Clery Act requires all institutions to, to collect crime reports from a variety of individuals and organizations that Clery considers to be campus security authorities or CSAs. The definition of who is considered to be a CSA is broader than just campus police or campus security, especially because we know that oftentimes students may disclose victimization to other individuals that they know and trust before choosing whether or not they want to file a report with campus police or campus security. So who is a campus security authority? Certainly campus police or campus security are um, considered to be campus security authorities, but also individuals responsible for safety. So that could be a resident assistant, that could be an access monitor. So students can be considered campus security authorities. We also know that individuals or organizations designated to receive crime reports are campus security authorities. So if you have given that information to students and if you have specified a certain individual or an organization as a place to whom students um, or faculty can report a crime, then that is designating them to be a campus security authority. And then lastly, officials of an institution who have significant responsibility for student and campus activities are considered CSAs. So here is where it's really important to pay attention, not just to title, but to a person's function. For example, a faculty member who doesn't have any responsibility for student or campus activities outside of the classroom would not be considered a campus security authority. 
However, if that same professor now becomes an advisor to a student group, he or she would now become a campus security authority. So in looking at who is not a CSA, we do know that there are some individuals on campus um, like clerical, cafeteria, or someone responsible for facilities. Now, it's important to remember that that doesn't mean that these individuals cannot report a crime. We are just specifying who is required to report if a crime is disclosed to them under the act. There are also exemptions. Pastoral and professional counselors are exempt as long as that was their role at the time of the disclosure. So for example, say there is someone who is a pastoral counselor outside of the institution, but his or her role at the institution is the dean of students, then he or she would still be required to comply because that is not the role that they play at that particular institution. So as you look at your own institution, you want to identify who those campus security authorities are and train them for their responsibilities. Training can look different at, at every institution. Um, some individual or some institutions choose to do annual notification using a letter and that form of notification. But we're really inspired to see many institutions going above and beyond, looking at how can we bring all these individuals together? How can we let them know not only what their responsibilities are, but how they can respond appropriately if someone would choose to disclose to them? Because no matter what, we want them to not only understand that role, understand their roles, but also be prepared for their roles under the Gene Cleary Act. Since 1992, institutions have also been required to afford certain rights to campus victims of sexual assault. And the rights that are listed in front of you have been required whether or not a victim cho chose to move forward with the criminal justice process or with the campus judicial process. So these rights include reasonable changes to academic or living situation if requested. And offering a change such as this is particularly important because in about 90% of these cases, the offender is known to the victim and could very likely be within her residence hall or his residence hall or within the classroom. So accessing these types of resources, letting a student know that if um, that these changes are available is very important. Also referrals to counseling and assistance in notifying law enforcement. So the institution must give the victim information about their on and off campus resources and must provide him or her with information about how to notify law enforcement if that's a choice or if that's a decision that the victim or survivor chooses to make. And the institution must support him or her in making that decision and moving forward with that process. Since 1992, there has also been that requirement that both the accuser and the accused have the same opportunity to have others present at, at a disciplinary hearing. And certainly the purpose here is so that things can be equal. For example, it would be unacceptable to allow the accused to have five individuals supporting him or her, but then limit the accuser to only one specific person. So we know that support from, um, from the people around them is important to a survivor and giving them that kind of access even within the disciplinary hearing is required. Additionally, victims in these cases have the unconditional right to be notified of the outcome of the hearing and the sanctions and the terms of sanctions in place. Therefore, an institution can't, cannot require a victim to sign a non-disclosure agreement before informing him or her of the outcome of the case. So they have the right to know that outcome and to speak about that outcome to anyone they choose. And certainly this right is critical because it directly impacts how secure a victim may feel on campus. For example, he or she should know whether or not the accused is allowed back in that campus environment. And lastly, the survivor's name and identifying information is to be kept confidential. So understanding these rights is important because the Campus Sexual Violence Elimination Act, or Campus SAVE, expanded these and other rights to victims of sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. So Campus SAVE was signed into law by President Obama on March 7, 2013, and it covers students and staff at institutions. It is the most dramatic expansion to sexual violence reporting and policy since 1992. And it was needed because, as we know, one in five women are victims of attempted or completed sexual assault during their time at college. Persons between 18 and 24 experience the highest rate of stalking victimization, and individuals 16 to 24 experience the highest rates per capita of intimate partner violence. And aside from these statistics, we are sure that all of you see the impact of these crimes um, or, and of these types of crimes at your own institutions, which is why the Cleary Center and other victim service organizations really did advocate for this type of legislation. So to start, 
Campus Safe adds domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking to the offenses for which statistics must be reported. And Allison will explain further what that means to your institution. I want to address there were two really good questions while Abby was explaining campus security authorities. The first question was specific to advocates, and the question was, how are advocates viewed under Cleary regarding reporting? And there was just guidance from the Office for Civil Rights specific to Title IX talking about women's centers, um, folks in advocacy centers on campus um, not being required to disclose information. However, under Cleary, it really depends on your state statutes and how your state looks or views um, advocates and the confidentiality that they have. So the answer to that is really going to be specific state by state. So I certainly encourage you to go and look at how your state views or categorizes advocates and also at your institution. How are you housed? If you're in the counseling center, if you're in a women's center, um, those types of things will certainly uh, be important in determining that. The other question was, if a professional counselor is serving as an advisor to a student group, a uh, professional counselor is typically exempt as a campus security authority. The only time a professional counselor is not exempt is if you designate them as someone to whom crimes are reported to. So if you tell your campus to report crimes to the counseling center, and you don't indicate to report crimes anonymously or confidentially, then the counseling center is going to have to give those results, give those reports over to campus police. That rarely happens. It's very rare that an institution will designate someone outside of security or campus police or public safety as to whom crimes should be reported. If a professional counselor is advising a fraternity, when they're acting in that capacity as a fraternity advisor, and they're approached or a crime is reported to them because it's their uh, fraternity advisor, then that's what they will have to report as a CSA. However, if they're approached or a student goes to them because they know they're a professional counselor or they go to them in the counseling center, then that's certainly uh, a privileged communication. So the definitions right now, and this is, I'm not going to spend too much time on the definitions. And the reason for that is that the Office of Post-Secondary Education is going to come out with regulations. So that will give us the regulations that we need to look for, just as we saw with Cleary and with prior amendments to Cleary. We want guidance. We need guidance from the Department of Education and the Office of Post-Secondary Education. However, the definitions that are pointed to through uh, the bill, and that came through, are from the Violence Against Women Act. So anyone who has, there are some campuses who get the OVW, Office on Violence Against Women, um, funding, and, and we actually serve as a technical assistance provider um, and do the Cleary training for folks who receive that funding. They're probably very knowledgeable of these on these definitions. If you don't have those that funding or you haven't created a policy for domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, you're probably less familiar with these definitions. Um, you want to make sure you know what, how it's defined in your jur jurisdiction. Um, and, and we'll go through what that is. So domestic violence, again, taken from, and we, we give you the code there so you have it. Uh, the term domestic violence includes felony or misdemeanor crimes of violence committed by a current or former spouse or intimate partner, which was just added, of the victim, by a person with whom the victim shares a child in common, by a person who is cohabitating with or has cohabitated with the victim as a spouse, by a person similarly situated to, the, to a spouse of the victim, under the domestic or family violence laws of the jurisdiction receiving grant monies, or by any other person against an adult or youth victim who is protected from the person's act under the domestic or family violence laws of the jurisdiction. So you can see the point, and that's why it's going to be really important. And you'll have time. You know, from what we understand and from past amendments, this probably will not take effect until the calendar year 2014-2015 annual security report. However, the reason for this webinar was to get out in front of this. So start to learn if this is something that your campus hasn't really tackled, Make a connection with your state coalition on domestic violence or connect with your county agency 
and understand what the laws are. You can also go through your DA's office. And it's really a good um, opportunity to engage them in a task force. Um, dating violence. So we have the definition there for dating violence as well. And again, this is coming from the Violence Against Women Act. Um, and you, you want to understand that the term dating violence um, refers to violence committed by a person who is or has been in a social relationship of a romantic or intimate nature where the existence of such a relationship shall be determined based on consideration of the following factors. And that will include the length, the type, and the frequency of interaction between those involved in the relationship. And again, I know that a lot of the questions that we've just gotten as an organization have been specifics to how are we defining this? How are we counting this? And what we're looking for or what there will be is more clarification from the Department of Education. Stalking. The last piece added here, um, stalking, it really uh, refers to engaging in a course of conduct directed at a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to fear for his or her safety and suffer substantial emotional stress. And the key here, this definition is really victim centered because it does say, even if the per it doesn't mention intent, it doesn't talk about intending to make sure to make someone fear. If the victim feels fear or for his or her safety, then that's certainly going to fall in the definition. And there, there is a free resource that was actually created a couple of years ago that's certainly relevant to Campus Save, the Stalking Resource Center, um, which is part of the National Center for Victims of Crime, has a wonderful resource for of a model policy for stalking on campus. So many campuses have already created, and, and it's something I, I know I talked about a lot when we talked about Campus Save, was these are policies that you should already have, or, or we hope you won't really be reinventing the wheel. Um, if you do not, some of your peer, inf peer institutions may have them. So I encourage you to share or reach out, or if you are a member of a consortium or something of that nature, um, to look into that. What's important to remember? The takeaway from the definitions. Or you want to use your local jurisdictional definitions. So you want to make sure you understand how your jurisdiction, where your campus is located, looks at these crimes. And again, we can't say in stone what this will look like. I think that many are speculating how the Office of Post-Secondary Education is going to um, come down with the regulations. So it's something we want to keep an eye on, and we'll certainly have a follow-up when we get that information. Using your state domestic violence coalition, your local district attorney's office, and then your state coalition will more likely than not point you to your county agency and your county organization is very knowledgeable on, they deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. They provide um, free legal help, free counseling, free education. So if you want to find the folks who know this inside and out, that is who's going to be at the folks within your county. And then reporting those crimes, dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking, they'll be reported in tandems, tandem with other crimes. So normally, if you think of hate crimes, if there's a Cleary crime with a hate crime, um, you report the hate crime. Otherwise, you don't report that hate crime if there's not a Cleary crime in tandem. When you have dating, domestic violence, and stalking, it's any other crime it'll be reported with. And again, the Department of Education will come down with further regulations on that. What I do want to review are the policy statements in the annual security report. So the new policy statements that you will be required to include in your annual security report. Those policy statements are going to be a description of the programs that you have to prevent these crimes, to prevent dating violence, domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. So you want to have a detailed description of what those programs are. And then you want to also include institutional procedures followed after these crimes have been reported. And again, it's an opportunity to not reinvent the wheel because you we have the Campus Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights, and many of you are already doing this with the Campus Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights or should already be doing this. So it's just a matter of possibly expanding those or what you have there reported there and including that. Um, in those pieces.
So we had a couple of different questions that were coming in, and we're going to address some of them in just a moment. But one thing that I wanted to point out from the Stalking Resource Center is they wanted to let you know that they are going to update um, that that model uh, program or the the model stalking policy. So that'll be something that you can look for from them in the very near future. And if you wanna look at what they currently have in place, you can do so through their website. So we really appreciate <coughs> hearing that from the Stalking Resource Center. One of the pieces that we're most excited about with Campus Save is the requirement for primary prevention and awareness programs for all incoming students and new employees. So essentially what we're seeing is it's about requiring institutions to move past just awareness about these crimes and really work to identify and change some of the social norms that allow these types of violence to occur and to engage the campus community in becoming part of the solution which is why the new requirements call for an institution to include institutional prohibition against these cases. So essentially it's establishing that domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault and stalking are unacceptable at that institution and laying that groundwork with the campus community. It also requires the institution to provide definitions under state law, particularly so that students and faculty can start to recognize these forms of violence when they're occurring on their campuses or even within their own relationships. It also requires that the institution provides a definition of consent, which really allows the institution to engage in dialogue about what consent is and what consent is not. And part of it is that institutions have to provide options for bystander intervention and give students and faculty tools to change their own environment. And the key here is really making it accessible and giving options that make sense within that particular community. A lot of times students don't recognize that there are ways that they can intervene, that when they are seeing these things that um, are really causing concerns for them, when there are red flags behaviors, behaviors that are happening, they don't always recognize that they can do so in a way that is safe for them and for the person at risk. And then also providing information on risk reduction. And as Allison just mentioned a little bit ago, a lot of institutions are doing this type of work and doing this type of education education already, um, but certainly this legislation really brings it so that institutions can be on an even playing field and that students are receiving similar education regardless of what institution they attend. Institutions are also required to offer ongoing prevention and awareness campaigns for students and faculty. So rather than a once and done scenario, I'm sure many of you are familiar that there's so much information that students receive coming onto campus and as freshmen. Um, so really it's requiring that that prevention education is an ongoing conversation that lasts throughout a student or faculty's time at an institution. So what does prevention education look like on your campus? It's really interesting to us as we travel throughout the United States, we see a lot of different approaches to education. So because every institution is different, really what we encourage you to do is consider how you can incorporate these, re incorporate these requirements into what you're already doing. A lot of you are doing some really excellent work on your campuses, and some of the programs you have in place really have a, a ground where you can incorporate bystander intervention and you can address some of these issues within the programs that you're already doing. And also, how can you connect with other institutions and with local resources in order to provide this education? So in just a moment, we have some of our local partners, as we mentioned, who are here with us today, and they're really going to talk about how they work with institutions in their own counties. Moving on through the policy statements, um, there's also a requirement uh, as we talk about the annual security report is also going to, going to have to include information on, and this slide is missing from here, but I want to make sure that folks know on no orders of protection, no contact orders, restraining orders. So really understanding um, what your campus, where your campus is, what's what's there, if you have protection from abuse orders, if you have restraining orders, and what the process for obtaining those are. And this is really, um, besides reinventing that wheel, it's a great way to partner with your local agency, because they do this, unfortunately, and most of them will say, unfortunately, they do do this every day. This is something that they have to do with their clients every day. So you want to make sure you build those relationships, because your students can certainly use those services. 
As we start to talk about the disciplinary process, we had a question come in about the preponderance of the evidence standard. Now, SAVE does uh, mandate specific elements of the student conduct process, and many of those ele elements mirror the Title IX guidance that came from the Office of Civil Rights when we received the Dear Colleague letter on April 4th, 2011. Um, the Title IX guidance points to preponderance of the evidence standard. That language was removed from SAVE. However, that is the guidance, Campus SAVE Act, when it was created, it has language that mirrors Title IX, the prompt and equitable investigation. Um, it has to be conducted by officials who receive annual training. And to be honest with you, from my experience um, teaching on a campus, past experience working on a campus, this is probably one of my favorite elements of this act, are that the folks who are hearing the cases are trained in the dynamics. And they need to be trained. They need to understand that not every victim or survivor will be curled up in a ball in a corner crying. That sometimes that person may giggle during a hearing. Sometimes that person may be disconnected during a hearing. And the folks who are hearing these cases need to understand those dynamics. The preponderance standard, as I said, is not in there. However, we know a very small percentage of campuses are not using that preponderance standard. Um, many campuses have followed suit with OCR's guidance as they should and are following that standard. The accuser and the accused, um, and again, that's language from the law, shall be simultaneously informed in writing. So they'll be informed of the outcome, of any disciplinary proceeding, uh, the institution's procedures for the right to appeal, any change in the results before they come final, and then when the results become final. Uh, I think most notable here is the appeals process to make sure, and this is really a practice that I would put in place even before this law goes into place, and it's also mirrored in the Title IX guidance, you know, letting students know when an appeal happens what the outcome is, because I think one of um, the problems that we've seen as an organization in working with victims in the past is um, if a student, if the accused is suspended until he or the victim graduates um, and then the appeal goes in and they're allowed back in a semester early, that's very traumatic for a survivor to walk into or to bump into the person either in a class or on campus that they thought were suspended until they completed their coursework. So again, these are things that were put in place to avoid any kind of re-victimization or any kind of trauma to someone reporting. Written information. Um, so SAVE requires that any student or employee who reports to the institution that they have been a victim, that they're provided written explanation of their rights and options for victims. Um, and this is something, I know as an organization, we created a Know Your Rights card that has all of the rights of a victim. You can certainly create one on your own, a sheet of paper on your own. You can customize it to your resources. Um, and to be, to be quite honest, it's really a great way of streamlining that process. You know, many times I go back and I use the example, explain it to me like I'm a three-year-old stealing it from Philadelphia. Same type of thing here, that sometimes it's so second nature for us. I know for me to explain, if someone comes up and tells me they've been assaulted, I could go through a number of resources, but that's so overwhelming for someone to hear. And many times for your students who are coming and reporting to you, they may not have thought about this, regardless of how much education they've had. So you wanna make sure you're giving them something tangible that they can actually look at and process when they walk away. And I think what Allison just mentioned is absolutely key because probably as many of the advocates um, on this call know, and many of you, anyone who's worked with a victim knows, a lot of times you could work with someone immediately following a victimization and you may have lengthy conversations with them. And the next time you go to meet them, they may not remember much of what was said or even remember who you are. So really providing that information and giving it in written form allows them, as she mentioned, to really process that and have those resources available as they're really moving forward and figuring out what suits them the best. Um, one question that um, we had was, since the information has to be provided 
in writing, is an electronic version of this information okay? Um, it's likely that it may be. We, that's something that we see with the annual security report within the Clery Act. However, it may depend on guidance. And we would always encourage you to consider all of the different methods of how you're communicating this to a student because there may be a time when providing that information in person with written information that you can hand to them may be more accessible and more appropriate for that particular person that you're working with. Um, but as we mentioned, that will be something that we'll, we'll certainly see based on that guidance and we'll determine once we receive that guidance. And one thing that I found very interesting is we had a phone call a few weeks ago from someone who was asking particular questions about SAVE and how that would apply to her institution. And during the discussion, one thing that she said is, oh, well, we're already doing a lot of this. And I know that that was an insight that Allison shared as well. So it's very likely that for many of you, as we're going through the webinar, you recognize that you have a lot of these things in place, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, for those of you who may see some gaps or you're finding some places where you think that more work needs to be done, um, I would certainly consider how you can reach out to some local and nonprofit partners. Um, so the Cleary Center is a national nonprofit, but we're located in Pennsylvania. So we decided to bring in some of our victim service partners um, who really have developed some strong partnerships with institutions in their area. So first, we're going to have Carol Ingentoli from the Crime Victim Center of Chester County. And she is a prevention education specialist at CVC, which is a private community-based nonprofit comprehensive victim service Victim Services Agency. With a background in education, Carol received her Bachelor of Science degree in Educational Psychology from NYU and her Master's of Science degree in Special Education from Hunter College. Working at CVC for the past six years, Carol has helped to develop materials for the educational programs presented in schools, writing books and creating games and lesson plans that encourage interactive learning. She's grateful for the for the opportunity her position offers her to reach so many people in her community. And she's gonna to speak to you a little bit about what that looks like for her. Thank you, Abby. Um, Security on Campus invited us to share some of the networking ideas we've been using with colleges in our area. And I really don't wanna mislead anyone into thinking that we have this fairy tale relationship with local universities. Uh, as with everything, it's a work in progress, but hopefully the ideas that we're sharing today can be springboards for your own partnerships. For those of you who aren't familiar with the suburbs of Philly, we invite you to check out Westchester. It has cute shops, historic buildings, great restaurants. It was rated one of the top places to raise a family and best places to live for singles. But unfortunately, even in quaint towns, violence can intrude, and that's where the Crime Victim Center steps in. CVC has been supporting victims in Chester County for four decades. Here we've listed just some of our services. CVC advocates accompany victims to medical, medical exams, police interviews, and court hearings. We offer support and information as well as individual and group counseling. And CVC provides all of its services free of charge, which makes us a very affordable option and resource. Um, the system of victim support works really well when we're alerted that a victim is in need but sexual assault is the most underreported of all violent crimes. Now, Westchester is the home to many universities. Here we've highlighted Westchester University. If you think of the unique, unique nature of a college campus, you understand the additional barriers that victims face. Fear of retaliation by the attacker, who may very well be a classmate or acquaintance, embarrassment, peer pressure, anxiety over underage drinking. These factors keep many victims silent. And for this reason, CVC offers two 24-hour hotlines, which are anonymous and confidential, so that victims or their friends can reach out for help. And no matter how much time has elapsed, it doesn't matter where our services are always available, even if the victim chooses not to report to police. We let students know that we're there to support them. And we do this through campus radio ads, sticker campaigns, brochures, and drop-in centers. We just want to get the word out that we're there to support students in every way. Now, how do we change this atmosphere where victims are afraid to come forward? Peggy Gus, our executive director, recognized early on that to support victims and raise awareness, we had to get members involved from the community. She knocked on many doors to forge relationships, whether it was police officers, hospitals, staff, colleges, and it wasn't always easy. 
Honestly, if there was a size seven patent leather pump wedged in a closing door, it was probably Peggy's because especially with campuses, it's hard to get connections going and even harder to maintain them. A lot of times you might find, you know, form really great bonds with staff, but then with transitions and changeovers, there's a breakdown in communication. So on both ends, both on the college's side and on our, our side, we have to work really hard to stay in the loop. Um, here we've named some of our target contacts at colleges. We meet with security officers for roll calls to remind them that they should call us in for cases so that we can be there to help out. We've built a strong partnership with the Women's Center on campus and student health workers consult with us often. Professors invite us to speak on different topics in their classes and CVC employees even teach a three credit course on victimization at Westchester University. And what's really cool about that three credit course is that a lot of times we have people from the health, education and nursing majors coming to sit in on the course. And these people typically go out to work in our community, which in turn will hopefully mean that they're promoting our agency's mission as well. CVC's prevention education staff runs student programs and RA trainings. And one of the most requested programs is the link, which connects drug and alcohol use to higher risks of sexual violence. And because most sexual assault victims know their attacker, we teach programs on healthy relationships, recognize good qualities in relationship, and examining the means, the meaning behind the word consent. We teach bystander programs, and that's important to encourage students to look out for friends who might be potential victims, as well as confronting friends who might be potential offenders. And because victims often turn to other friends for help, CVC tries to teach kids how to be caring and knowledgeable first responders. Over the years, our agency has teamed up with fraternities, sororities, and campus service organizations, uh, events such as Take Back the Night, the Vagina Monologues, and our annual Race Against Violence are very popular. Uh, the Race Against Violence, we especially depend on those in-shape college kids to support us and participate. And it's always amazing that our agency, which offers a 40-hour training in order to serve as a volunteer in our, agent, in, in our community, it's amazing how many college students sign up for that 40 hours of training so that they can serve in the community. Many of them even go on to intern with us and, and work with us. CVC's recent project that we're really proud of is the Sexual Violence Prevention Network of Chester County. It's a primary prevention-based coalition that we have co-founded. And what we're really excited about is that Westchester University has joined us in partnership in this coalition. It's thrilling to see college students, especially the male students, embracing an approach that moves from being problem-driven to vision-driven. So, in thinking of vision, let's look to the future. These are challenging times for colleges. We totally get that. You're accountable for so much, but in monitoring your current operation systems, don't lose sight of the positive things you want to promote. It's not enough to just respond to criminal cases. It needs to be matched by primary prevention that challenges the values that tolerate sexual violence. Primary prevention isn't just a buzzword. It really makes sense. Rather than expending energy and resources putting out fires, let's look for the factors that cause them in the first place. If the goal of primary prevention is to alter mindsets that contribute to victimization, what better place to start social change than on the teaching grounds of a college campus? The progress might be slow and gradual, but isn't that how evolution works? If you close your eyes for a second and imagine a community that promotes respect, positive decision-making, and healthier relationships, wouldn't it all be worthwhile? So please don't forget to turn to your local victim service centers for support. Forming active alliances can actually increase the resources that you have available. And by working together, we can pave the way to a safer future. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, and in addition to the Crime Victim Center joining us, we also have Tommy Wilkins from Laurel House from Montgomery County, who's going to talk a little bit about what they do. So Tommy Wilkins is currently serving Laurel House as Director of Community Education and Volunteer Services. In this capacity, Ms. Wilkins is responsible for community education and education to middle, high school, and college-age students on the topics of dating and domestic violence. She is also responsible for training both Laurel House staff and volunteers. She provides hundreds of hours of training per year to thousands of individuals on the issues of dating and domestic violence. She started the Laurel House Dating Violence Poster Contest in 
2011 was the third year, um, and they continue it forward. Ms. Wilkins has been a valued member of the Laurel House staff for almost 16 years, and she's going to share a little bit about what that looks like and what her partnerships look like within her county. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, there we go. Um, just to kind of cut to the chase, we as a full-fledged comprehensive domestic violence program are providing services across the board. Our services as listed are open to all community members. If we look at specifically at college students and high school students and college campuses, looking at explaining to them who we are, what we do, and what we offer. Just to skip ahead, looking at our services and building. Sorry about that. Looking at services and making connections. Our goal in being 30 years in existence is building safe communities and looking at college campuses as communities and communities as, of the future and looking at the education. So we touch base with a number of college campuses because as in Chester, there are a number of colleges and universities here in Montgomery County. So looking at reaching out to them, also looking at the organizations on campus that would be interested in or would have a connection to domestic violence and dating violence and the services that we provide or offering education. We look at making a first basic connection with students and with departments that are connected. So looking at making that outreach to the social work department, the psychology department, even communications and art departments. And building the connection, if we go basically to the art department, bringing in our children in our shelter to the university or college, to their art department or community, community education, community, communication departments, forgive me, and bringing in our students onto campus to do art projects, to spend the weekend on campus or to spend the day on campus, which gives the students an opportunity to do some volunteering, also to see firsthand what is happening going into the classrooms and giving basic curriculum classes on domestic violence. Because if we're working on educating the students and the students become educated, they look at their community around them. They become more aware of their surroundings, are more available to their friends and other students on campus because they are your eyes and ears. They're going to see what's happening that you don't even know is happening on campus. And if we start educating them as to what's happening and what to do when they see it, then working with also in same time in tandem, working with the college or coming up with policies and procedures and how to handle this when it happens, you're going to come together with a good policy, a good program, a campus that is aware of what's happening and the students are able to make some changes. Um, what we have been doing and we continue to do is to work together with the fraternities and sororities and engaging them in having events on campus, on having movie nights, on having um, participating in our 5K, 5K dash run, um, having students participate, the constant participate in the poster contest as judges as recruiters for the poster contest. So also having them work with our public service announcement contests where they mentor high school students in doing programs and doing PSAs, doing, commu doing community service drives where they're collecting items for the program. All these things work towards that education so that they're aware of, they see the importance, they see that dating and domestic violence for us is a everyday community thing that they can do things to end dating and domestic violence. They can do things to educate themselves and protect their peers. And also as they leave the college campus and get into society as a whole, they become citizens who are more aware and able to help things happen. If we look at the college as a whole, 
It is going to the departments. It is making the department heads, the president, the co-presidents of where the issues, having the students come together and present to the presidents and chairs as to the issue and their concerns, having students form groups that work on some of the school's policies and assist in some of the school policies with the escorting a student from one location to another location when it's after hours. So we look at bringing just, not just the college and university staff involved, but making the students involved also in whatever policies we're looking at doing. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much to Tommy and Carol for joining us. And, and really, the goal behind this was to help you break down those silos, because we all know we live in, like corporate America, college or university life can be siloed. Um, you know, it's something that I've experienced firsthand as well. And you know, something that we like to do, and we're happy to provide technical assistance or talk with you, brainstorm with you on how you can build those coalitions. We have a lot of toolkits that can be used to build committees. It's intimidating if you have never pulled a committee together to run those meetings besides providing the free food. Uh, there's a lot more you need to do. So we've worked with a lot of institutions who have provided us information that we can share. And we also have some tools that we're happy to share with you that we've created for trainings if you want to start to build these committees, because you do need to start to think about it. You need to get a sense of your climate. Um, today, I'm actually going to a partner university with whom we work in our area to their take back the night tonight and was invited to attend, happy to attend um, and talk a little bit about what we do. But also, it's really great to always see administrators in the audience who are getting a sense just firsthand by sitting and listening to the climate of their campus. Um, and they're truly there um, to understand what the climate is. And that's something that Title IX really illustrated with the Dear Colleague letter was that we need to understand what our campus climates are to truly change the culture. And it's something through all of the evolutions in the 25 year history of this organization that we have really been committed to. Um, I do wanna also point out that we have several free programs. National Campus Safety Awareness Month is in September. And we have a Safe Campus Strong Voices campaign. And I also typed it out in the chat to everyone that you can go to our website and register your campus to receive the free toolkit. And that toolkit is really a cafeteria plan. You can pick and choose what you want to use, get some ideas from it. The thing we're most excited about is we are partnering with five colleges and universities, Western Colorado State, Rowan University, Framingham State University, Northern California State University and Northern Illinois University on this Pact Five series. And it's going to be, it's with documentary film students who are using the documentary art form to create prevention education around sexual assault. And then in tandem with that, they've created a website and actually an online pact you can take to stand up to violence on your campus and in your community. So that's going to be a national movement that we're very proud to be a part of. If you would like more information on Cleary and about the elements of the law, we do offer Cleary Act training. Our next regional trainings are in Edmond, Oklahoma, San Francisco, California, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Nashville, Tennessee, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And Abby and I will be back and forth at both of those. So you can also say hi to us if you'd like, but that information is on our website as well um, and certainly available for you to look at. But again, don't hesitate to reach out with questions. We're really here to provide you with as much guidance as we can. One thing, as we worked with many of our partner organizations to advocate for the passage of this law, we also were very cognizant that if you don't have OVW funding or you're not funded to provide these programs, that it can be a challenge. So we really committed our organization and we're very vocal about making sure that we would get out in front of this and provide free resources for folks who needed it. Um, a lot of you, as I mentioned, uh, some of your questions were very individualized to your campus. So we made sure to answer them um, in the chat box. Uh, one of the questions we had was about the in writing. Is the electronic, is that okay? Um, again, that's something we're going to have to wait and see what the regulations say. 
any of you who are, who are familiar with the annual security report, there are specific standards in terms of um, sending that report out. So really, I would imagine in this day and age, it will be okay. But again, I think we need to wait for post-secondary education and the regulations. One of the questions was, when will we have those? Um, the answer is, to be quite honest, we have our, some of our staff is meeting with the Department of Education tomorrow. So we can kind of um, see if we can maybe get an answer on that. And we'll certainly publish that um, through our social media. We're, we're very active on Twitter and Facebook. Another question we have, will institutions be required to send out timely warnings regarding these crimes? It really depends with, as with all timely warnings, if there's a current or ongoing threat to student safety. Two, the second kind of test there is, is it going to, you don't want to give out the, if you think it would identify the victim, you certainly don't want to send that out. And if it would hinder the investigation, you don't want to send that out. So you definitely want to make sure that um, you're using your discretion because so much of campus policing is discretion. Uh, questions about if you have a campus intern or if you have someone working in a counseling center who's being supervised by a licensed counselor, they are that is a privileged communication if they're receiving direct supervision from that licensed counselor. Um, if a student has an order of protection on file, will that be reported as a statistic? And again, this is if a student has an order of protection on file and they report that this happened and it's in the Cleary geography, area, so on-campus, non-campus, public property, then yes. But again, I think a lot, and, and really we're not saying this to be vague, we just don't want to give you guidance without knowing what the regulations are from the Department of Education. So um, some of that will be coming down the pike, and we will be sure to have a follow-up as soon as that comes out, because I think it's, um, it's great to have them in layman's terms so we can all truly understand what we're doing to comply. So again, I want to thank you all very much for taking the time. We have Abigail's contact on here. Um, it's aboyer at clearycenter.org. We also, again, Tommy and Carol are local. So I realize if you're in another state, they may not be your agency to look to. But if you have a question on how to find, you know, you want to find your Crime Victim Center or Laurel House near you, certainly call us and we can help you make those connections. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I always challenge folks to do when I do trainings is to make some new connections, build those bridges. Um, those of us and everyone I'm sitting with around this table presenting this webinar, we all have nonprofit experience and there are some positives of that. And one of them is you really learn to be resourceful because you have to be. So we're happy to help you in tight budget times have to make those connections. So I want to thank you um, very much for joining us. This will be available. This webinar will be available on our website through our social media. You can watch it as often as you like um, if you want to go back. Uh, we'll also make the slides available. I know there was that one missing slide that some folks asked about. That will be included um, in a PDF form and sent out to all participants. So again, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon.